Well, hey guys, Phil here from the Blue Envelope channel. So in this video today, I wanted to talk about uh, Stephen Lett of the Governing Body and kind of explore his life a little bit. So just to like the other videos on other, um, you know, Governing Body members have done, I'm kind of trying to create a holistic timeline of his life using um, whatever is published in the Watchtower, public records, and a little bit of background check info. Yeah, so just kind of using hard facts like that. Unfortunately, he's never been, hasn't had his life story in the magazine just yet, so don't have quite as much information, but still you can get a pretty good picture of him. I'll tie in some stuff from forums that folks have written about him too that have run into him over the years, but um, that's a little less verifiable information, so I'll, I'll kind of point that out as it comes up. I think maybe the first thing to address before anything else is what is up with his speaking style. He certainly has a very uh, unique way of giving talks and facial expressions. So I've seen different, you know, speculation. Did he have a, a deaf family member when he was growing up that made him speak like that? Or has he had some kind of medical stroke or something that affected how his face moves? And I guess all I can say is anything is possible, but I haven't really run across anything to anything that would indicate that it's anything more than just a, a mannerism he's kind of picked up over the years. You know, as you read uh, posts from folks who knew him when he was at Bethel, they said he seemed completely normal, spoke normally and whatnot, um, nothing out of the ordinary. And the same way folks who had his parents in their congregation. They don't mention anything, you know, unusual about his mom or dad that might have affected his speech. And so as you read different recollections people have, the first time you see it cropping up about his odd speaking style is uh, when he was in the circuit work. Now, initially I was going to say that probably after 40 years talking that way, it's hard for him uh, not to. But then again, check out these couple clips from a, this was a video on the Warwick Construction Project a few years back. If we look at the history of those taking the lead, they've never been sentimental toward material things. Uh, they were willing to move the headquarters from Pennsylvania to New York. Um, they've been willing to sell buildings. They've been willing to buy buildings. See, they're always thinking, well, what's best for kingdom interest? We're not attached to anything material. There's no doubt about it, there's a lot of work yet to be done. Our project is just now getting into full swing, but we're confident that the Dear Bethel family will be up to the task, that you will rise to the occasion, you will do what is necessary to get this work done. And we're confident that the volunteers coming in to help us, that they will rise to the occasion. And with Jehovah's Spirit, we'll all work together unitedly and we will get done what Jehovah wants accomplished. Love these so these clips are pretty straightforward, you know, pretty run-of-the-mill speaking here. So it appears that that very expressive speaking style he uses is something he can sort of turn on and off depending who he's talking to. And for whatever reason, he tends to like to use that when he's giving talks to other witnesses. So that's about all I can tell you about that. All right, so uh, let's talk about his family a little bit. Who are his parents and whatnot? Well, his dad's name was Mark Arlett. He was born in 1925. Uh, he died in 1986, fairly young, at age 61. His uh, Social Security card was issued in 1936 in Alabama. So he would have been 10, 11 years old and evidently at that point living in Alabama. His mom, uh, her name was Jean, Jean F. Lett. She was born in 1926. I'm fairly sure from the records I've seen that she died in 2012. However, I do see her name still crop up a little bit on some property records more recently than that. So I'm not 100% sure if she's still living or not. Her social security card was issued in 1936 as well. Uh, hers in Tennessee. So evidently at that point, she was living there. And that's about all I have on his parents at this point. Um, you know, evidently they grew up, they ran into each other, they got married. 
I'm not uh, totally sure if they were raised as witnesses or not, but it, it certainly seems that by the time um, Mark, uh, uh, Steve was a teenager that he, you know, he had been raised as a witness. And yeah, so that brings us to uh, Stephen Lett. So he was born in 1949. Yeah, so it puts him about, you know, 71 years old nowadays. Uh, his full name is actually Mark Stephen Lett. So he's actually a junior, <laughs> just like literally everybody else on the governing body seems to be a something junior. And so he actually is Mark Jr., but goes by uh, his middle name, Stephen. For the rest of the video, I'll, I'll call him Steve, Steve Lett, because that seems to be the name he prefers, he goes by. And uh, Stephen is more just something for certain legal documents and watchdog articles. So Steve was born in 1949, then his brother uh, Tim was born in 1951. So uh, two years later, Timothy Ray Lat was born. It's just the two of them, as far as I know, just uh, Steve and Tim and their parents were the complete family. Okay, so the next time we run into Steve is when he graduated high school. So this was in 1966. Obviously, the Vietnam War was going on at that point. It's kind of an intro. Um, last week, I did a video all about the draft, which was going on in the 60s in the U.S., and how Jehovah's Witnesses handled the draft at that time. So maybe watch that video first for more information. It, I tried to get pretty detailed about it, but just to kind of you know give you the cliff notes that the way the, the Watchtower Society had set it up that essentially young guys, if they wanted to get the minister classification uh, so they'd be exempt from the draft, they either had to uh, regular pioneer or go to Bethel for the society to give them that. And so, you know, all the young guys of draft age, 18 to 26, they pioneered. And then many of them did, I don't know if it was most, but many certainly went to Bethel. And Bethel was a four-year stay at that time, four-year minimum. And so, yeah, that's exactly what Steve did. He graduated high school and he got right to work pioneering in December of 1966. And then in 1967, he headed off to Brooklyn Bethel to do his four years there. So that's where he was at until uh, 1971. So I guess you can look at it one of two ways. You can say he spent four years at Bethel, which definitely a good while, you know, you could say that he left Bethel the minute that he was allowed to, and really both things are true. Now, at the time Steve was in Bethel, the New Bethelites, which had the term new boys, although they did take girls, they took single women too at that point, but all the new boys would be assigned to the Brooklyn Heights congregation, which was the congregation right inside Bethel headquarters. So they'd all get assigned to that congregation for six months, and then they'd be assigned out to some other New York City congregation. Bethelites called that being in primary, those six months there. And so I ran across one post from a, a young woman. She was one of those single women that uh, became a Bethelite. So she came in 1969, so about two years after Steve did. And she writes that when she was in primary, that she was assigned to the Greenwich Village Book Study and that Steve was actually her book study conductor at the time. So again, you can take this with a grain of salt. You know, I can't verify all this in the forum posts. I read some of her other posts and she seemed pretty <laughs> legit. But yeah, she mentions, uh, you know, her and Steve and a few other Bethelites that were in that Greenwich Village book study, you know, going down there every week in the group. Um, so she remembered that. Another thing she remembered that was kind of interesting was that at that point, Steve professed to be of the anointed. And so he was partaking of the emblems. Even at that young point, let's see, he was, uh, so that was 69. So he would have been around 20, 21 years old at that point. And actually a, a separate forum poster did recall the same thing when he was at Bethel, that Steve was a partaker. So that's kind of interesting. You know, that's the thing you hear with Bethelites now and then that young guys will come into Bethel and it's a super spiritual environment and they and it's not unheard of that young guys start to feel that they're anointed and they'll they'll start partaking and it seems like most of them 
maybe do it for a few years and then they kind of quietly stop and you know get over that spiritual high yeah evidently steve never never stopped professing to be of the anointed well i'm sure you would get a little heat for being so young and saying you're anointed i i think ultimately it's turned out you know very well in in helping him progress through the ranks of the organization over the years i guess that's a, a pro tip if you're a male witness and you want to really progress you know to the point of being on the governing body definitely the move is to start being a partaker when you're young and just never stop just stick with it uh, one post mentioned that he seemed to recall that steve may have worked in the sewing department at bethel again it was a single post so i can't confirm whether that's true or not just to throw in a plug for um, a book that was published in 2019 called new boy uh, by Keith Casarona. He was a Bethelite from 1970 to 74, so he overlapped Steve by a year or two. And really interesting book, kind of a, a little bit of a no-holds-barred look at Bethel and how it was a little rough to be at Bethel in that, in that time period. It, it definitely got a little plusher over the years, which is saying something. So definitely maybe check that book out. He doesn't mention any, he mentions a lot of Bethel people, but no, uh, nothing about Steve Lett in particular. So what you tended to see at that time period um, was that combination of fairly arduous working conditions at Bethel and combined with uh, wanting to get married because you weren't allowed to get married uh, and stay at Bethel at that time. So that kind of meant two things generally. It meant it was extremely unusual that any Bethelite would stay more than the minimum four years. Secondly, it meant that most Bethelites got married very soon after they left Bethel. And so Keith in his book writes that uh, most of the guys that he knew were, they would start dating uh, somebody while they were in Bethel, and then they would time it so that they could get married literally the, <laughs> the week after they their time was up and they could leave Bethel. He says he was an exceptionally patient Bethelite. He waited two weeks before he got married after leaving. So as far as Steve goes, I'm not sure exactly which month Steve left, but he definitely got married the same year that he uh, left Bethel. So he was married on October 9th, 1971. So conveniently, we have his marriage announcement from his wedding, and there's some interesting features of that. So we'll We'll check that out a little bit. So again, this is October of 71, and this was published in the Anniston Star. So Anniston is a town a little bit east of Birmingham, Alabama. And so here we're introduced to Steve's wife. So her name was Susan Lynn Camp, and it mentions her dad was Fred M. Camp. And then a couple of her siblings were in the wedding, a sister named Jesse and a brother named Steve. And so the camps were from uh, Weaver, Alabama, which was just a little bit north of Anniston. So Steve and Susan got married in the Anniston Kingdom Hall there. Yeah, let's see, I guess it'll be their 50th wedding anniversary next year. So how about that? Now it mentions here that Steve's parents, as well as his brother, were in Clarksville, Al uh, Clarksville Arkansas at this point. So Clarksville is a a town in the Ozarks out there in Arkansas. It's interesting, just kind of a random coincidence, Clarksville is only about 100 miles west of Heber Springs, Arkansas. That's where the longtime elder Rod Watkins was last fall sentenced to 80 years in prison for multiple counts of child abuse. Now reading through uh, different you know references on forums about uh, Steve Lett, uh, there were a few folks that seem to remember Steve's parents serving their congregation in the circuit work. And then I saw a few other posts that mentioned his parents being special pioneers at that time. So, I, I mean, I guess they could have done both things, but at least in Arkansas at this point, it sounds like they were special pioneers because uh, Tim was there with them as well. So remember, Tim was born in 1951 so he would have been up in the 1970 draft lottery. And so, yeah, since we see him in Arkansas a year later, you know, there were those two routes you could take. You could either pioneer or go to Bethel to get the minister classification. And so evidently he chose the pioneer route, uh, at least at that point. And so he was um, out there with, with his parents. We see here the little um, 
announcement mentions that Merton Campbell gave the wedding talk. So Merton was, uh, I guess you'd say a Bethel heavy. He was in the service department at Bethel. He'd been there since 1950, was in the service department until um, many, I think it was almost 60 years he was working in there. And so he eventually became a, a spokesman for the society to various news organiz organizations. So I remember in my time, like in the 2000s, you'd always see, uh, I think it was J.R. Brown was the, the name on press releases, the witness, you know, kind of PR rep. But before J.R. Brown, uh, Merton Campbell was the man. And so if you Google him, you'll see him pop up a lot, uh, you know, giving statements for the society. Merton's wife, Olga, had her life story was in the March 1st, 2008 Watchtower. So she gives a little more information about Merton. But uh, yeah, so it looks like, you know, Merton and Steve got to be uh, good friends at Bethel. And Steve was able to have him come down and give his wedding talk in Alabama. We see here that Steve's brother, Tim, was his best man. And then another one of his groomsmen was uh, named Demara Tidwell. So he was a fellow that was from Alabama, but you can see it looks like he was at Bethel at the time of the wedding. So uh, I'm not sure if they knew each other, if the Lutz were in Alabama previously, and so they grew up together, or if they ran into each other at Bethel. But so he was in the wedding. Um, Demara, he later left Bethel, and uh, he currently has a pest control company near Anniston, Alabama today. Just to throw in uh, a more random trivia, I ran across his dad, Johnny Tidwell, I ran across his obituary, and I just wanted to put this up because he, he looked super cool in his hat here. So Johnny was a longtime witness there in Alabama. So yeah, so after they got married, Steve and Susan started special pioneering uh, like uh, Mark and Jean Lett were doing, and like many witnesses were doing. Just to mention, this is in the pre-1975 buildup, and there were a lot of uh, pioneers and special pioneers at that time period. And so we next find them, both sets of Letts, special pioneering in the early 70s in Illinois. And so for a little more information on this, I'm going to flip over to a clip from a, a video that Cliff, the XJW 5th, he interviewed a, uh, a woman named Joy a little while back. And Joy has a really interesting story. She was pioneering and then her and her husband went to Bethel. So they were in Bethel in 1975. So she has some really interesting recollections about what the mood was like there. So definitely listen to the whole interview. But I'm just going to play a, a short clip where she um, talks about the Lutz a little um, bit. So you and your husband pioneered, you were telling me, for just a couple of years before you went to Bethel. Is that correct? Right. We after, we after we got married, we moved to where the need was great in the circuit, and it was a congregation of about 15 to 20 publishers out in the rurals, mm. out in farming country. Wow. Uh, one other couple, there was another couple that came in to help in that congregation, and that was Mark and Jean Lett, whose hmm. son is Steve Lett. So we knew them well. Wow. So you knew Steve Lett's parents? Yes. And, and my husband knew Steve Lett from Bethel because they're both at Bethel during the 60s, ah. late 60s. And they were out special pioneering in Illinois. We were in a congregation in Illinois also. So, yes, we knew them. We got to know the family well. So you didn't necessarily have a relationship with Steve and Lett. Is that correct? It was more so your husband? Convention work. You know, we'd see them at pre-convention work right. every year. Uh, the few years that uh, we were out pioneering before we went to Bethel. Mm -hmm. it, now, play cards together, that type of thing, but not not a friendship that we would go up and just visit them by ourselves, no. Right. Okay. So when you went to Bethel, that was 1975, is that correct? Right. Early in 75, uh-huh. Okay. So I have a total okay. So Joy and her husband went to Bethel in early 1975. So we can kind of get a time frame here. They got married the end of 71, and she... They left Illinois in early 75, so we're kind of talking in between those two years is when the Letts were in Illinois. So Mark and Jean Lett were in one congregation with Joy and her husband, and then Steve and Susan were in another Illinois congregation. Now, it was right around 75 when uh, Steve was selling a car. He put an ad in the newspaper, and the car was a Chevy Corvair. Eventually, a young guy around 19 years old came down to the old barn lot where Steve had the car to 
check it out a little bit. And he ended up buying the car from Steve. And uh, that young fellow's name was Tim Mannion. Now, after the car deal was done, Steve, who would have been about, you know, five years older than Tim, give or take, took the opportunity to start witnessing to, uh, to Tim. And Tim kind of, you know, took to it. Steve started studying with Tim, and in short order, uh, Tim got baptized. And he would become an elder, you know, uh, down the road. Uh, and then secularly, he became a polymer scientist. So uh, Tim and his wife, Lisa, they had a baby around 1989, and uh, they named her Chessa. But by the early 90s, the family was thinking a lot about how they could uh, be more whole-souled than serving Jehovah. And, you know, periodically the society will publish recommendations about moving where the need is greater, to step over into Macedonia like the first century Christians. And many witnesses really take that counsel to heart. For example, in the 86 Watchtower, July 1st, there was an article and it said, God's will is that this good news of the kingdom be preached worldwide before he brings an end to the present world system. This gives all the more reason to respond to the call for more full-time ministers if your circumstances allow for it. It is reason, too, for elders and ministerial servants to make themselves available, to move into congregations where there may be a need for their help. I know, thinking about my own family, my parents really paid attention to that article, and after it came out, they um, talked to local circuit overseers to see if there were any congregations nearby that, they, that could use another elder. The CEO suggested a couple of congregations that would be good candidates. And uh, so it was around 1990 when my family moved about an hour away from where we had been living in Rochester, New York, out to the Newark congregation. And for the Manions, it was similar. There was another article that appeared a few years later in the Watchtower, the June 15th, 92 issue. And that article said, what else has furthered the global fishing work? Thousands have been willing to respond to the Macedonian call. Just as Paul was willing to move from Asia Minor to Macedonia and Europe at God's call, many witnesses have moved to lands and territories where there is a greater need for kingdom preachers, as well as for elders and ministerial servants. They have been like literal fishermen who find their local waters to be well fished and move out into waters where there are fewer boats and the fish are plentiful. Well, Tim and Lisa took the admonition in that article to heart. Tim began to arrange his work so that they would be able to move out of Chicago to a congregation that could use some more help. They talked to their local COs about, you know, congregations in the area that could use another elder. They got the names of a couple good candidates. In particular, they zeroed in on Havana, Illinois, which only had three elders at the time. And so it was in 1994, the Mannions moved out to Havana, that's a small town about three hours outside Chicago. So they moved there. And uh, if you've read the Philadelphia Inquirer article or watched the Oxygen documentary, The Witnesses, you might know the rest of the story that Chessa, who was five years old at the time, was raped the night they arrived by the son of one of those three elders. The uh, Mannions initially took the pretty bold move for a witness at that time of calling the police, but uh, eventually they decided not to press charges once the, the full pressure, the full weight of the Watchtower organization kicked in uh, on them. But uh, definitely that night's events continued to weigh on the family. And uh, if we skip forward to 2002, Tim watched the Dateline special that aired that year in which uh, Barbara Anderson, who'd been at Bethel for many years, she laid out pretty clearly the problems within Jehovah's Witnesses with child sexual abuse. Obviously that jived with Tim's own experience. And he was moved that year to write a five-page letter to Steve Flett, who not too long before had been appointed to the governing body. And uh, basically in the letter, he, he kind of pleaded with Steve to use this new position of power and influence to change how the organization handled child molestation. Now, Steve did write back to his old Bible student, Tim, in June of 2002. In that letter, he sympathized with what the Mannions had had to go through 
and you know urged them to continue their faithful course in the organization. Uh, he did not really directly address at all changing the watchtower policies. If we skip forward to 2015, that's when a talk from Steve appeared on JW Broadcasting. And in that talk, he used the opportunity to dismiss any talk that the organization was soft on pedophiles as ridiculous apostate-driven lies. Example, think about the apostate-driven lies and dishonesties that Jehovah's organization is permissive toward pedophiles. I mean, that is ridiculous, isn't it? If anybody takes action against someone who would threaten our young ones and takes action to protect our young ones, it's Jehovah's organization. We reject outright such lies. Another example. In 2019, Tim Mannion died, partly from complications of decades of trying to manage the pain with alcohol. Chessa, meanwhile, has become an activist dedicated to forcing the organization to change their policies about child sexual abuse. It's kind of interesting to think about how their lives may have taken a, a different path had Tim never met Steve Lett that night. Well, jumping back to the 70s, after Armageddon didn't come in 1975, a lot of JWs just kind of gave up for a while. And it was a pretty abrupt change, uh, almost like a light switch just flipped. And I talk about that a little more in the draft video that the end of the service year in 75 seemed to be the cutoff point where folks were expecting, you know, Armageddon to come or something. And so September really was a drastic shift. And by October 75, 30% uh, of the country was irregular in field service. And we see that reflected in, uh, in folks we know as well. Tony and Susan Morris both quit pioneering that year. It appears that Mark and Jean Lett quit pioneering that year from records we'll see later. Uh, I don't know whether Steve and Susan did or not. Uh, I don't exactly have that information. I do know uh, in 1979 that Steve started as a circuit overseer. And so he and Susan were in the circuit work until 1998. So that was roughly 19 years. Um, so probably about six circuits were served over that time period. I can kind of point out three of them at least, I think. So the first circuit we can peg him being assigned to was in Western Kentucky. So there was a post on Reddit from a, you know, XGW, and he remembers that Steve and Susan visiting the Owensboro, Kentucky congregation. He pegs that at being in the early 80s when that was happening, and he was kind of a little kid at that time. He mentions that at the time, the Lutz were one of those CO couples who had a camper and they would park it at the Kingdom Hall they were visiting each week. He put up a couple of photos here that uh, his mom attended Pioneer School one of the years that the Lutz were serving the circuit, and so Steve was one of the instructors, and uh, so he got a couple of pictures that his mom took of uh, him with Steve and Susan. So that was in the early 80s. In the late 80s, we find Steve and Susan in a circuit out in Wisconsin. Steve's dad, Mark, had died in 1986, and we see here a document, an affidavit from Steve, uh, dated in 1987, and he mentions that he's living in Oshkosh, Wisconsin at that point. And then if we skip forward a few more years, we can put the Letts in Elmont, New York in 1993. So Elmont is a little spot kind of right between Queens and Long Island in New York City. And in our real estate document mentions that their address was in Elmont at that point. It's kind of an interesting thing. I noticed a little bit with Tony Morris, and now I see it here with Steve Lett as well, that as they get closer and closer to joining the governing body, the circuits that they're assigned to kind of start zeroing in closer and closer to Bethel uh, geographically. So evidently the organization kind of wants to check them out more personally before they get the okay to make the next move. Evidently everything checked out well with Steve. And so in April of 98, he and Susan were pulled off the road and reassigned to Bethel. So Steve was put into the service department and he became a helper to the teaching committee. 
So that was 98, and then at the annual meeting in October 99, it was announced that Steve was appointed to the governing body. And it was actually uh, very unusual. It was a class of four that day joining the governing body. The other fellows were Sam Hurd, David Splain, and Guy Pierce. Now, it's pretty notable because this was almost the first time that this sort of second generation anointed or young anointed were joining the governing body. Maybe the one exception would be Garrett Loesch because he had he had been appointed in 1994. He just missed being on the governing body with Fred Franz by two years. But there were nine members on the governing body at that point, and really all of them except Garrett Loesch were of that original Fred Franz era. In fact, by 2010, all of those governing body members had died, all eight of them, except for Garrett. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe Garrett saw he would be drowning in paperwork once all the other super old governing body members died, and so he was able to get some younger faces on the, on the board to spread the work around. And yeah, so you know, since 1999, Steve's just been busy doing governing body things. In more recent years, he's become a, kind of a popular TV personality on JW Broadcasting. So we've mentioned that one talk he gave where he talked about whether or not child abuse is a problem in the organization. You know, another notable talk he gave was about money, uh, specifically how the society needed more of it. <laughs> it's definitely one of the bluntest talks I've ever seen about the need to donate more money to the organization. And especially such a high-ranking, you know, governing body member delivering the talk was pretty unusual. Another memorable talk told Jehovah's Witnesses that they should be willing to paint the Kingdom Hall with a two-inch paintbrush if they're ordered to. A uh, behind-the-scenes episode he did gave us a good shot of his rather interesting comb-over hairdo that he's had for many years. And yeah, so that kind of brings us up to date on... Steve Flett and his JW career. So maybe we'll cut there, call this part one, and then in part two we'll return to his uh, family, his parents and his brother, and see what they've been up to over the years and how Steve was involved with them. All right, well thanks for watching guys. Uh, you know, subscribe if you feel like it. We'll catch you in the next video. Take care.